pasamos a continuación a la, a la segunda ponencia de esta tarde, que bueno, pues va a ser realizada por Alexandra eh, Maquintos, que se ha incorporado recientemente, en junio de 2021, al CIAP, ¿no? el Centro Internacional de Arte y Paisaje de la isla de Basivier, que está bueno, pues en la región de Limousin, en el centro de, de Francia. Y, bueno, previamente hay que decir que Alexandra, como habréis visto en la biografía, pues tiene mucha experiencia también en proyectos de arte y naturaleza en Canadá, ¿no? donde ha tenido pues, bueno, diferentes eh, trabajos en este ámbito. ¿no? Eh, bueno, pues ha estado en el Fogo, en, Ter en Terranova, también ha formado parte del BAMF, ¿no? que es reconocido también aquí en Huesca porque es sede del BAMF, ¿no? del Festival de Cine en este caso. Huesca es la es eh, la ciudad bueno, pues donde se representa el BAMF, ¿no? es una sede internacional del BAMF. Y bueno, pues ella nos viene a hablar del CIAP, que es uno de los centros que ha sido el referente en términos de arte y naturaleza también en Europa, pues porque ya tiene una amplia trayectoria y algunos de los centros que han venido trabajando en este ámbito, pues sí que se han mirado pues, al CIAP, ¿no? que, que bueno, Alexandra os va a explicar ahora mucho mejor y que realmente pues, es un espacio pues, muy, muy agradable. ¿no? Entonces, Alexandra, ya cuando, cuando quieras, eh, adelante. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for being here. I'm going to deliver my presentation in English. I'm very sorry I can't do it in Spanish, but uh, it's a learning process. So thank you very much, first of all, to Roberto Ramos de Leon and the SIDAN team and, and Elena as well for their very warm welcome, as well as the invitation to be here. Um, as Roberto mentioned, I'm director of the International Center for Art and Landscape on Vassivier Island, or the Centre International d'Art et du Paysage. And this is, of course, a new position for me. I moved to France six months ago, so it's still very much a process of, of learning and, and discovery. So what I'd like to do today is give you an overview of the Art Center, its origins and 30-year history, and also present the artistic and cultural project that I've proposed for the center, which will define its strategic objectives and programming over the next few years. So the International Center for Art and Landscape supports research, experimentation, production, and dissemination of contemporary art. And it's really quite unique within the French artistic landscape. Uh, it's celebrated for its remarkable contemporary architecture, its open-air permanent collection, and its programs exploring the intersections of art and landscape. So this image is, of course, Vassiviard Lake and the island, and you can see the pedestrian bridge that connects the two. And to give you an idea of where we are, we're in the Limousin region, which is central France. It's a very remote rural region, at least rural, remote for France, let's say. Uh, and the closest city is Limoges, which is about a 45-minute distance from, um, from the island. The, the lake, Vassivier Lake, is situated at an altitude of about 700 meters on the Plateau de Mille Vaches, or in English, the wonderfully titled Plateau of a Thousand Cows. And uh, the plateau really has a very rich range of landscapes from peat bogs and wetlands to forests and heaths, and it includes many fragile ecosystems that are the source of um, streams and rivers in that region. And the forests here are very, den very dense, very thick, and they're full of Douglas fir trees, which are, of course, not a native species to the area. They have been planted over many, many years for resource extraction to be cut down for timber, basically. So here's an aerial view, once again, of the lake and the island. And Vassivier Lake is one of the largest freshwater lakes in France at about 1,000 hectares. And it has a fascinating history because it's, in fact, an artificial lake. It was created in 1950 through the construction of a hydroelectric dam, which then flooded a large area. And Vassivier Island was, in fact, the highest hill in the area, which became an island as a result. And some communities were abandoned in the making of the dam uh, and were flooded. And there's still some traces of these communities at the bottom of the lake, as you can see here. And supposedly, on rare occasions when the water is very low, you can actually see a spire of a church from one of these communities, which is quite possibly an apocryphal story, but it certainly adds to the imaginary around the island. And there's once again the bridge that leads to the island and on the shores. And this is the art center itself. 
So the center opened to the public 30 years ago in 1991, but in fact its origins are earlier. Um, in 1983, starting from 1983 to 1985, a group of artists and citizens who were really passionate about art began a sculpture symposium on the island, a granite sculpture symposium. So they would come every year and build new sculptures. So here's one example by Max Linder. And these first initiatives constituted the beginning of a sculpture park, which was later accompanied by occasional exhibitions in the island's castle and outbuildings. And finally, in 1986, a desire emerged to create a permanent space for contemporary art on the island. So a dedicated building was commissioned, designed by Aldo Rossi and Xavier Fabre, and built between 1989 and 1991. And the center was the first building by Aldo Rossi in France, and it's really quite distinctive in his practice, which usually centered on, on urban environments. And the proposal for a lighthouse that you can see, this is the, er the early model for the building, um, was very much part of the first architectural vision for the project. It's intended really as a site of observation and reflection, which is then extended horizontally by a place of research and creation, materialized in the building dedicated to exhibitions. So here's the, the tower, the lighthouse being built, and then the horizontal building, which follows the pitch of the landscape, as you can see here. And the building throughout is full of windows that kind of frame the landscape from inside. Um, so it's, I would say it's very much iconic architecture, but also on a human scale and refers constantly to its environment from you know, the dam itself and the lake to ideas of navigation and connection and communication. And it's certainly a place that's full of creation and exhibition and character and very inspiring to its occupants and hopefully to visitors as well. Here's an aerial view of the building, and you can see part of a, a work that I'll show you a larger picture of later. It's a drawing on the landscape by Jana Friedman of a unicorn. And it's a drawing in marl, which is a mixture of clay and lime. I think it's, in French it's called la marne. I'm not sure what it would be called in Spanish. So I'll give you a kind of quick architectural tour through the building, which will also give you a sense of some of the exhibitions that have been presented over the last few years. So this is the entrance to the lighthouse, or the tower, and this is the ground floor, and you can see the spiral staircase that goes up the interior of the lighthouse uh, to the lantern, which is a viewing platform. And the, the lighthouse itself is open to the public year-round, and it's free entry, so there's about 40,000 people every year who go up and down 107 stairs. Um, and this is the view from the top. And I mentioned the Jana Freeman unicorn, so that's to the left of the building. And on the right side, you can just about see another piece by Jana Friedman, which is called Belkis. Belkis was his dog, and it's a drawing of his dog made in buckwheat. So it grows throughout the year and changes as well as it, as it flowers and then, and then dies over the course of the seasons. And there's the unicorn from further away. So inside the building, this is, our, this is actually our current exhibition, which is called The Wisdom of Lianas. Um, and it was, it's an invited curator who's a philosopher called Denetem Tuambona. This is the main space, the, uh, the Nef. So this is actually an image from 2003 by Eric Samak, who has a number of works also in the sculpture wood that we have. But here you can see how the light from those windows travels throughout the building. It's really quite a spectacular space. And here's a completely other treatment of that space. This is Reto Pulfer from 2015. And Angelica Marcoul from 2020. Now this is a hallway between two exhibition spaces, but once again, you can see those windows that frame the landscape and offer views throughout. Uh, this is a space that was, each space of the building from the very beginning was given a particular designation and a title. This space was the, is the atelier, so the studio, and it was very much intended to be a space for artists to make work, uh, a residency space right from the outset of the building's construction. It's since been transformed into an exhibition space, so this is a piece by um, uh, Flora Fécans, who's uh, from Ile de Réunion in our current show. And that's a continuation of the space. Sorry, Florence Félix is the artist's name. And again, a different view. This is a show in 2015 of the same space. 
And this is two floors up from there. This is the Salle d'Etudes, so another exhibition space that's under the roof. Um, and if you see those glass doors, if we go through those, there's a, a walkway which leads to this space, the Petit Théâtre, the small theater, which has tiered seating. And it's, most, again, mostly used as exhibition space, uh, as well as public performance space and um, mediation and this kind of thing. And this, this tiny window is on the back. You can't see it here. You can just about see it in that image there. So this small window is at the very back of the building, and it overlooks the lake, and you can see the dam if you, if you look closely. So at this point, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the project that I proposed for the center called Situating Landscape. It's an artistic and cultural project that will define the strategic objectives as, of the institution, as I mentioned, as well as the programming over the next three years. Situating Landscape is an exploration of the relationships between humans and the environment. Deeply anchored in the local fabric and landscape of Vesivir Island, the project extends from the local and regional to the national and international. And that's both through its programming and development of networks, as through interrogating issues of contemporary concern today. And for me, the specificity of place is a form of resistance to forces of globalization which erode cultural differences. And by place, we can magnify local forms of knowledge, relationships to the landscape, and to the social and cultural histories that are embedded within a site. So the Art Center is uniquely suited to offer artists and researchers an immersion in the place, in place that is essential to resisting flattened landscapes of globalization. Artist residencies, site-specific exhibitions, and projects that engage with locally relevant themes are all ways to resist these forces. At the same time, I think um, it's extremely important to be both locally engaged but cognizant of the larger issues that we're all facing today, whether those are artistic, political, economic, or environmental. And having worked over my career at three institutions that offer artist residencies, for me, these are a really powerful way to engage with place and offer an immersion in a site. Um, and the artist residency program at the Art Center on Vesivia was initiated in 2012. Since then, over 160 creators and researchers have participated in the program, which celebrates its 10th anniversary next year. And they are housed, uh, this is a living working space, this is the castle of the island, um, which belonged to the Vesivia family, from which of course the lake and the island take its name. And this is the current photo now. So the, in 2012, the building was rehabilitated. The interiors were rehabilitated by two architectural firms, Berger, Berger, and Building, Building. They both have double names. And so it combines lodgings as well as shared studio space. And on the interior, of course, is ex extremely contemporary white space um, that, again, frames the landscape in quite specific, rate, specific ways. And the residency program, basically, uh, we invite artists to stay for about one to four months to have an immersion in the landscape and the history and culture of Vesivir Island and its surrounding communities. And there's also a real emphasis on creating connections for artists and residents with local people and local practices or, or other institutions, whatever might interest their, their, whatever might inform their research, but really as a way to help them become acquainted with the landscape and the territory. So for me, once again, residencies are really a privileged site for artistic experimentation and exploration, research and exchange. And they are in lots of ways, um, for, at least for my project, a kind of anchor to the center's activities. And so for the exhibition program in future years, some of, some of the artists who've been invited into residence will be invited back to create works very much in relation to the space, having had time to maybe make sense of it in, in the inter intervening months or years to come but it means that there's the possibility that they create works that really have an, an anchoring or a relationship to that place. Now, the sculpture wood, uh, this is a map of the, of the whole island with indicating all of the sculptures we have outside. Um, so the sculpture wood has about 60 works that reflect really the major movements of contemporary sculpture, so from Arte Povera and land art to more ephemeral in interventions and um, protocol works as well. 
This is a piece by David Nash. And the, the pieces are located throughout the forest, meadows, and shorelines of the lake. And they're both monumental and discreet. And you could discover them at a walking pace and according to the different changing seasons. This is Olivier Mosset, Frédéric Olero. This actually has a second component, which is a kind of knit cozy that goes on top of it. It's quite beautiful. This is Jean Clairbou. And again, under the snow. Roland Cognier. So one of these is a tree trunk, and the other one is a re reproduction of a tree trunk in, in stone. And this is one of two uh, inflatable architectural structures by Hans Walter Muller, which are great fun. And we're just about to restore this one here and, and make it into a sort of permanently accessible space. This is one of the others. This is Andy Goldsworthy, one of the, maybe one of the most famous pieces in our collection and certainly the most Instagrammed, I would say. And it consists of two stone spirals, two granite, granite stone, stone wall spirals, one on the land that frames a grove of trees, and the other um, reaches into the, sh into the water across the shoreline. And what's one of the amazing things about this piece is that you discover it according to the season. So in the, in the fall and winter, the water levels in the lake go down, and so the wall emerges out of the lake. So I'm still in the process of seeing what this piece looks like after six months. And it's also very evocative of those communities that were submerged when they built the dam. This is Marco Borgia Stella. Uh, Ilya and Emilia Kabakov, Toilet on the Mountain. Michelangelo Pistoletto. There's, I think, six of these, of these stones that are placed at, usually where two paths cross throughout the sculpture wood. This is Francois Bouillon, again, a protocol piece. So it's in granite, and it has, uh, if you see it from a particular angle, it forms a complete circle. And every year on the solstice, June 21st, the, the, the circle is lit, so it becomes a, a circle of fire that you can observe that day. And it was quite wonderful, because my first day of work was June 21st, so I had this wonderful welcoming ceremony of, of fire when I started. This is Michael Salesdorfer, again, a protocol work where a patch of, of land in the forest is cleared um, according to the seasons. And this is Bernard Calais. It's a, a work with granite um, and stone, granite on the top that becomes a very reflective surface. This is Gilles Clément. So we saw him in Turin, and here he is in France, not too far from where he lives and has a garden. And this is the Prairie Fleury. So it's along the shoreline in this beautiful garden of wildflowers that, again, evolves throughout the summer and, and into the fall. Um, I was mentioning earlier the need to be both very locally connected but also aware of sort of global currents and networks. And some of the programming that I'm hoping to develop for the center in terms of the local connections is going to address some of the contradictions of this area, which is rural and remote, but also widely visited as a tourist destination. Uh, an island that was formed artificially as a result of resource exploitation and a landscape that's replete with both native plants and invasive species that also hosts contemporary architecture. This is a piece by David Jones. But in order to sort of, in order to connect those contradictions that I was mentioning to sort of larger questions of contemporary concerns, some of those thematics that I would like to explore are, are the ideas around altered landscapes or resource extraction and climate change. Um, uh, also food security and sustainable agriculture, uh, contamination as an instigator of diversity, and local intelligences of humans and non-humans, interspecies relationships, these sorts of ideas. This is a, a clearing by Liliana Mota. Um, and also, importantly, the capacity of art and architecture to enact social change. This is Oscar Toison. It's quite a amazing work that makes you slightly nervous when you pass near it. It's a large uh, piece of granite in a tree about 10 meters above your head. This is a fountain by Joël Turlings, who's uh, from Belgium, and it works according to the level of water in the lake. This is Jean-Pierre Hulen. Another view, and you can see someone fishing on the behind. This is Vladimir Skoda. Kimio Tsushia, and for scale, with my colleague standing next to it. 
And this is also Kimi Otsushi, a piece called Eternity. This is Jean Estac. This is quite an old work in the collection, but it's really quite wonderful. Um, I'm not sure if you can see from the slide, but the, the rectangle in the center of the sculpture is a window with some objects that the art, artist inserted when he first built it. And in the intervening years, a fern somehow made its way behind the glass and grew into, into his piece. And we had, apparently there were many discussions with the artists in terms of preservation of this piece and sort of its invasion, let's say, by nature. And he was very, actually, very content to let that fern be there and continue to grow inside his sculpture. Uh, and I'm sure of, of many of us here, we could have probably very interesting conversations about what it takes to maintain works in the open air and the considerations of the life of an, of an artwork in, a, in nature. But well, that's maybe a topic for another day. This is Anne-Marie Junier, some neons installed in the trees. And this is outside on, on the art center itself. Bernard Pages, a very postmodern gesture that sort of inverse it, tried to invert the um, verticality and horizontal, horizontality of the art center itself. Again, under the snow. Reto Pulfer. This is Alexander Ponomarev, Subtiziano. It's actually a submarine that um, has been in the water for 10 years, and we have actually just taken it out to figure out how to restore, how to restore it. This is a skate park. This is a Kujong A, a piece called Otro. And uh, it's painted with phosphorescent paint, so it glows green at night. And these are some kids doing their thing. And so the, so the sculpture wood is, is about 60 works on the island. But a few years ago, under the previous, director's, um, the previous directorship, Marianne Lanever, there was she initiated a project called Vassivier Utopia, which was really just conceived as an extension of the sculpture wood offshore. So it's a, this is a series of nine architecture and landscape works um, initiated from about 2018 in nine communities around the lake. So this is one in Saint-Martin-Château by Atelier Bivouac. This is in Emoutier, which is where I live. It's a platform for viewing the town by Atelier One to One. Quite simple, but really effective. This is in Beaumont-du-Lac, which is the community closest to the lake. And it's a series of markers and aids, I suppose, to take you on a path through the landscape and down to the lake, where you can see various interventions. And this is in Canoui by Gamma and Bianchi Maillard. So it's a sort of public platform viewing space. We had a public event in here in the fall with a storytelling event, and it was wonderful to see it animated with so many people. This is Magranja, it's a sort of space in the middle of a forest that you can sort of stumble upon accidentally and come to this clearing and rearrange it yourself or tidy it up if you feel like it. So a lot of these interventions in a way um, draw attention to things that are already in place. This is in La Selle by the group Amical, cooperative group, collective group rather, Amical Millefeu. Um, yeah, so they may draw attention to existing features of a site or otherwise take you on a new route to experience a familiar landscape in a new way. This is in Ned, the community of Ned, and it's by Atelier du Silon and Philippe Bess. And this is Nina Chalot and Foral Studio. They made a series of columns out of uh, rammed earth. And lastly, this is called La Fauvette it, by Bureau Baroque. It's in Faux la Montagne. And it's a mobile drinking bar or a social space, um, a really sort of fun intervention that citizens themselves can move around and use as they wish. And the, the, the conventions or the agreements for these projects are each with the different communities, and they were set for a three-year term. And at the end of the three years, there's a, there will, which is next year, there will be a discussion between the center and each community as to whether the center wants, whether the communities rather, want to take on these projects and maintain them for future years. So they become basically property and responsibility of those communities or otherwise they are dismantled. 
Uh, one thing I haven't talked about yet is our public programs and mediation, but the center offers a comprehensive range of public and educational programs for diverse audiences, including artist talks and film screenings, performances, open studios, workshops, and other events. And programs for children and families, underserved or marginalized communities, and educational workshops developed in partnership with schools and universities are all intended to offer sort of multiple points of access and engagement. So this was a, a sound workshop, a radio workshop for kids inside one of the sculptures, or where they basically went around the sculpture wood and, and tested various acoustic pro properties and made recordings with the sculptures. And my goal really is to make cultural and educational mediation a central element of the center's activities and not something developed as a kind of afterthought to an exhibition. Um, this is, of course, a challenging mission, for me at least, and I'm still thinking through how to do it. But in the context of the art center with its rural location and comparatively low population, one way that seems promising is to develop projects with specific groups over long periods, so either several months or even years, where you can really have a much deeper engagement with them and create a sense of um, faithfulness. It's not really the right word, but anyway, a connection that, that is built over time with various groups. And whether school kids or marginalized groups, this form of regular engagement offers the, yeah, the potential to create deeper relationships and the idea that the center could actually become a true resource for different communities. And another form of mediation or activities that I'm keen to, de to develop is the idea of co-creation. So in other words, working with communities to define their needs and interests and figure out how we can work together to build something that, that really serves their needs and, and desires. And so um, everything I've shown you so far um, has been you know, an attempt to kind of show the diversity and richness of the art center over its history and this sustained engagement with art and landscape that continues to unfold. Um, my programming begins in March, so I haven't been able to share specific projects thus far, but I think, you know, most importantly, I would say that at the heart of the project that I have proposed for the center is the conviction that art and artists have the capacity to enact social change and offer new perspectives on issues of contemporary concern. And artists' contributions to culture, society, and, and knowledge productions are more urgent than ever in this age of instability, inequality, and, and environmental crisis. One thing I will show you, this is a piece by a German artist, Isa Melsheimer, and she's uh, the first exhibition I'm gonna program in March 2022. So you're all invited to the opening if you'd like to come. And uh, so I can show you this piece. This is, so Isa Melsheimer has a long-standing engagement with architecture and um, really the history, of modern, the history and legacy of modernism. So already the context of her work in relation to the Aldo, Rossi, and Zavifa building is, is exciting. But also in the last few years, she's been working a lot more with ceramics and really questioning interspecies relationships and sort of and integrating organic elements into her work. Uh, and given the proximity of Limoges and the whole por porcelain industry around the region we are, it seems also like a natural fit for exploring both ideas of ecology and landscape and environment, but then also kind of the local history of, of material and artistic production. And there's a picture of the center from this week when it snowed, much to the delight of all my colleagues and me too. And here it is under the sun. So thank you so much. It's really wonderful to be here among many like-minded like people and projects and institutions. And I really look forward to continuing the conversation and determining how we can act together to create a better future. So thank you very much. Thank you.